Sometimes you didn't have to put anything in your mouth at all, apart from maybe water. But again, boredom, stress, where your where your focus is, what your emotional response is. So maybe your emotional response to stress, to upset, to heartbreak, to pain in your life, the emotional action that you used was food, which is a legit fucking thing. It's how me- this is how way way more people get into the obesity realm than this world's willing to admit. To, again. We do, we, we say it. calorie deficit is important. Progressive overload is important. I agree. And this is, this is why, and I know I sound like I've been the unpath- unempathetic prick out of the two of us today, but most people get fat because of struggles, mental, physical, emotional struggles. So you need to create solutions for people. You need to empathize with people. And I just think, I think, I think it's getting lost. So in this episode, I wanted to go a little bit into low carbon, low calorie dieting. And this was kind of inspired a little bit by a few posts that I've seen recently about people saying like six week challenges will ruin your physique and there's no place for the crash diet and there's no place for low carb. So to open this, I wanted to use this episode as a one, if you're someone going through a low calorie part, a grind part of the diet, we're going to offer some solutions to help you with that. Some hacks that we found from doing this. But to begin with, we're going to talk low carb, low calorie. When is it good? When is it not? So to start off with, Rob, do you think there is a place for a low carb phase in dieting? Phase, that's the key word. Yes. Low carb phase, maybe more than one low carb phase. Multiple reasons for it. I do not believe in low carb long term. I've tried it myself and that's anecdotal. Um, But there have been clients where I've seen decent results on a longer term low carb phase again. Um, But I've seen just as good results with people that never gave up carbs to begin with. And there's, you know, there's there's things we can look at overall lifestyle, amount of protein, activity, etc. stress levels, things like that. But the type of carb also being kind of important too at the same time. So if you can get the same results or similar results without needing to go low carb, there's not much of an argument for going low carb. But there are, which we're going to discuss, there are pros to going low carb, of course. Mm. But it's not a a one-size-fits-all approach. That's the important thing to remember here. I think what you've essentially just said, you've seen people get in great shape with low carbs, and you've seen people get in shape with lots of carbs. It's like, mm. doesn't that just add credence to the fact that calorie deficits w- is what matters, right? Like in, yeah. in, in a world now where this, this, this is sort of getting the fads coming out again. You know, yeah. keto, <clears throat> high carb, low carb, Atkins, fasting. Mm. There are people who get in shape with all of them. And it, it's, it's sort of like, okay, what's good for that client? that is in front of me right now, what suits their lifestyle. And I think what a lot of people don't take into account is like there's optimal and there's practical, right? People like to fight optimal online, but if if my diet plan being low carb means it's easier for them to get into a calorie deficit without having to think too much, it minimizes margin for error, and it makes up for the fact they might go out and break their diet every now and again because of the bigger well, depending on how big the deficit is, because low carb doesn't necessarily mean low deficit, but usually sure. it does. Yeah. It gives a bit of leeway. And I think people are trying to find this diet that someone can 100% stick to all the time. And sometimes the one that someone can stick to is yeah. a diet that accounts for the fact that your client won't be 100% on it all the time. Yeah, that's so key. So key. It's, okay, you know, it's the, the, the best diets are the ones that you kind of enjoy because depending on your goal, there has to be an element of, I'm, I'm, I loathe to use the term suffering because it's not fucking suffering. It's dealing with hunger and a bit of low energy, depending how low you want to get in body fat. If you want to get in shoot shape, stage shape, then yes, there's going to be some issues with energy and overall zest for life at certain points because you will then have to be on a, a very, very low amount of food. But that's not relevant for the general population that are looking to drop. Maybe 20, 30 pounds tops, maybe more, maybe more. But depending on what you want the end result to look like, the diet can then change. So a big thing to remember as well is big problem with the industry right now is people that have got in shoot shape or stage shape that now preach their methods as the general population method. And it's not 
the fucking case. Like, we're going to talk about low-carbon, low-calorie hacks that probably aren't relevant for someone that's just going into a very, very slight deficit because they've got a real struggle in their history of dieting or they've never dieted before or they really need, you know, a deeper education first and see some consistency. So you might only put them into a very, very, very slight deficit or their activity is through the fucking roof. So in which case, some of those things aren't relevant for them. But you have to remember, it's all, there's different stages of the journey and at each different stage of the journey, there has to be potentially a different phase you move into similar to your training. Training is not going to stay the same from day one to day 365. You're going to go through different phases. So why wouldn't you do that with your diet as well? So there's no 100% consistent diet. There's no one size fits all, of course. Yeah. But there's many things that work for many, many people. I think there's a lot of the issue here is that people confuse the words um, sustainability with habits. Mm. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that because that doesn't necessarily sound that it makes sense. But people now want this diet that is going to be sustainable. So like, how do I set yeah. somebody up now with a diet that they're going to feel they can do for five years? Yeah. And I'm like, well, a lot of what you consider sustainable now is based off the habits you currently have and the comfort yeah. zone that you're currently in. So like, is there an element of like, if you want to get out of these habits, you're going to, no matter what you do, it's going to be somewhat yeah. uncomfortable. What sustainable right now could be your two chocolate bars in the evening, your three times a week piss up with the boys, a cup a delivery every single evening. If that's what you class as sustainable, then you're never going to find a diet that works for you. Now, whereas mm. if you go through a period of time where I go, look, let's, let's get some structure in place. It's, it's going to be harder, but let's get yeah. you through your eight, 10, 12, 16 week diet. And obviously we don't want to make it horrible. We want to make it tailor it over time more and more to you and your current lifestyle. Yeah. But when you get to the end goal, then it's like, well, what do you want back? And let's say we had that person who had a couple of chocolate bars in the evening, had a three piss ups with the boys, had a delivery four nights a week. By the time the end, they may just want one drink with the boys on a Saturday night. And Ooh. they may want like one date night with a partner. That's Ooh. what the sustainable is because now what you valued, Ooh. what you truly value is important because you can go, right, I've missed this. I want this back in my Ooh. life. Whereas a lot of that stuff was just habitual that you felt yeah. you couldn't go without your caffeine or you couldn't go without your chocolate bar or you couldn't go without yeah. this. It was just what you've been doing rather yeah. than necessarily something that you, is, a, is a non-negotiable least to No, massively so. It's, I, I want to say Mark twice said this. I can't remember for the life of me where I read this, but it's been a game changer for me in terms of how I look at things, in terms of programming for myself, diets for clients. Well, in terms of everything, every area of life really, we said, I swear it was Mark Twight, and, tw tw and I'm sorry if it wasn't, um, but I also know a lot of people trying to lay claim to this quote that are completely fucking off the mark and don't even understand it. But what's optimal isn't always sustainable. So you've got to find the balance, right? The thing that you can sustain for a little bit might not be 100% optimal in terms of reaching your goal, but it's just right for your environment and your lifestyle at that time with some slight changes in there to make sure you're actually going to see some sort of progress. But in terms of what is 100% optimal for 100% of the population to lose weight isn't sustainable for every single person to do. I would add to that. I would add to that because I, I think what's optimal isn't sustainable. But on, if you put optimal sort of like in the middle of this spectrum, what's optimal may not be sustainable, mm. but what's optimal is also not always practical. Yes, so exactly. we've got it. We've got to scale this back. This is the same mm. argument I have from people want recipes. Two reasons why I don't like recipes. One, you don't want my recipes. I'm a crap cook. Um, <laughs> two, like you have, I like, like I get it. People assume that diets are going to be boring. That we're conditioned to think that way, and sometimes they are yeah. because people are mm. too comfortable where every meal is going to taste like a Gordon Ramsay Michelin star restaurant where it's a Wednesday in between meetings. Sometimes yeah. you just got to get you by. And some meals have got to be nice, right? Like mm. people say food is for fuel, not for enjoyment. Yeah. I don't want to hang out with those people. But at the same time, people feel like every meal has to be a taste sensation. You're living a pipe dream. So, yeah, it. you know, we've got to find this sort of middle ground where some meals are just going to be fine. Some, mm. like, like just in life, some days are just fine. Most days are just fine. And then there's yeah. some like blow your socks off incredible um, yeah. sort of meal. So when we're looking at practicality, right, it's, it's, People go, oh, well, maybe I've, I met, what's my low carb pizza? And then I'm going to have this high protein, low carb carbonara. I'm like, okay, cool. Have you got six hours a day to prepare your food? Like, if you do, you'll get it done for four days and you'll crash and burn. Yeah. I would rather simplicity over quote unquote in taste bud sustainability any day of the week. 
hundred percent. This is why anything I ever do share with my clients in terms of recipes, which is rare, um, because again, like I, th- I think this is one of the issues with meal plans as well. Right, a generic meal plan for everyone is is going to work for a very very small percentage of people. A individualized meal plan has a huge increase in percentage of chance of it working, right? Because it's individual. Recipe guides, I might go through a recipe guide and find two things out of, out of 20 that I actually want to, that I'm actually going to enjoy eating. But everything I give to my clients in terms of recipes is real food and a real meal that is not going to take you long to fucking make. That You can probably make double of and it's not going to go bad the next day. Um, the big issue I see with the industry doing now is these, these hack guides. Here's how you can make 20 fakeaways that, that mean you have to order 20 different ingredients on Amazon because you can't get this stuff in Tesco. And I'm not being funny. It's not going to taste as good. It's not going to be as good in terms of um, uh, consistency, in terms of like how it actually feels in your mouth because we notice these differences. It's going to be shit. I don't give a fuck if, if, if ex-competitive Tina or Tony have a my protein discount that they want to that they want to you know max out their affiliate earnings and they're showing you here's how you can make protein cinnamon buns that taste as good as the real thing you're lying you're absolutely lying it's never going to taste as good as real thing it's going to cost you more to make the real thing never i had a protein mars once when they first came out and i went this is shit does protein house does protein house h-a-u-s still exist in london I believe I could be wrong. I could be wrong. That could be long gone. I could but, be wrong though. Like that's like that was the thing. It's like, oh my god, a protein Yorkie. And I just realised that like, some of these things are more calories. And I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. Why don't you have a protein shake yeah. and a Yorkie? It's not the same calories as this protein Yorkie. So why would exactly. I not? Why would I have the inferior product and I have to yeah. spend more time doing it, especially if I make it myself? Yeah, exactly. What are you, what are you going to enjoy more? What are you going to feel more rewarded by doing? No one. It, no one eats a protein bar and goes, that was amazing. I feel so satisfied. My sweet tooth is curbed. I feel like I've made a smart choice towards my, towards my diet. When you can educate people how to have that Yorkie and a protein source as well and feel exactly the same or feel better than mate you who's lying about his protein bar because no mm. one actually enjoys eating them. I'm going to sound like a drill sergeant. PhD bars. Yeah. Take it. Bar's all right, but I'm gonna sound like a drill sergeant yeah. um, here when I say yeah. this. And like, I also, I, I also think you have to earn the right to curb a craving. Now, sure. I'm, any, any, yeah. anyone sitting on the fence, you know, that wants to work with me online, and I'll probably like put off the idea. But in a way, good <laughs> because if you're gonna come and bitch about curbing cravings within the first twenty yeah. minutes, then I probably don't want you anyway. And yeah. but because it, it's. <laughs> It's this, it's this thing of like, oh, well, I need, I need to curb that craving. Cool. Run me through your day, right? Oh, I haven't mm. eaten any vegetables in 20 years. Cool. So how much protein do you have? Six grams of protein. I'm like, okay. So, so let's look at why you have the craving first. You're ravenously mm. hungry. You're on three hours sleep a night. You know, you haven't spent any time with anyone that isn't a work colleague in 15 years. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah cool. So yes, the problem is you don't have a PhD smart bar. <laughs> Sort your shit out first. <laughs> Fuck, mate, it's so fucking true. But I see if I walk around I, the city. I will say just to morning, give a caveat go on, go on, before go on, you say your point. Go on, go on. I, I'm not saying that I'm this perfect person that never never has cravings. But I never yeah. I never have a craving. I never go to the shops and buy a six pack of Kinder Buenos and wolf down the lot and sit there and go, oh, what I need? I need I need I need a protein shake curbing of that craving. that's what next time if i have a protein bar i won't have that chocolate what i'll go is like what was the trigger for that chocolate bar and i always yeah. take ownership of whether i fix it or not we all mm. have our struggles 100 percent. like i understand mm. if i'm not saying i don't give a fuck about why you overeat on chocolate but i'm yeah. saying it's like you're lying to yourself if you think it's going to be curbed by a sweet replacement you're, yes. you're just trying to you're trying to put a plaster over a bullet hole Mm, massively. And you have to remember these cravings aren't just necessarily coming from something related to your food. It can just be habitual or it can be through pure fucking boredom. So in which case, <laughs> that, that, that smart bar or whatever your choice you're going to go for, again, isn't going isn't to do it because you've not fixed the habit. 
then you've not fixed the environment. You're just trying to, again, like, like that plaster analogy is absolutely, absolutely fucking perfect. You're trying to then write, okay, let's, uh, what's the, what's the tiniest thing I can do that makes me feel like I'm moving forward, which is not going to move the needle at all. It's not going to change the percentage of your result. It's, it's not. If you look at the absolute leanest individuals on the planet, which would be stage competitive bodybuilders, like in terms of low body fat, I don't mean in terms of lean and healthy. I just mean in terms of low and body fat. Those guys aren't living off of protein bars and protein hacks and things like that. They're still getting the, the large majority of their diet through actual whole foods. No one, no one at any point needs to live off of these hacks, which a lot of, a lot of the industry is promoting almost as a fucking lifestyle. If it fits your macros, it's terrible for that. Yeah. Creating all these I, fakeaway recipes. And... I'd love to see, I don't, I, there will never be this, but I'd love to see statistics yeah. of people are buying protein bars. How many people are buying protein bars with the um, idea of fitting them within a well-balanced macronutrient plan? And how many mm. people are buying protein bars with the, so they have the sensation that they're doing something positive for their health and yeah. actually not even paying attention to their calories and their activity mm. whatsoever? It's, it's, mm. yeah, I think protein mm. bars are, and I like the occasional protein bar, but I think protein bars mm. are often, and I've done this. I've had a protein bar. Well, it's fine. I have my protein in it. And it's me kidding myself. So I understand this. <laughs> yeah. Like, I think protein bars are the, the, the biggest sort of fake diet food ever because they yeah. are, they're, just, they're justifying people's bad behavior. They're like people out trying to, well, I did 30 minutes of cardio so I can go and have my pizza. Yeah. It, it, protein bars are the same. And ridiculously overpriced. Three pound fifty in some shops for a fucking grenade bar for twenty grams of protein. That doesn't work out right at all. Like if you think, okay, right, so an actual bag of protein <clears throat> is obviously a bit more expensive, but for your thirty grams, you're probably breaking that down to under a pound. So to then go and get a heavily marketed, pretty poor nutrition wise. 20 gram serving of protein and pay over three quid for it or two pounds 75 is the cheapest i fucking see it in the shops doesn't doesn't add up and then you know we can push the argument that healthy food is more expensive but it's not healthy food it's really not fucking healthy food it's not something you would live off but again it gives you that illusion that you're doing something right how many girls i see in the city first thing in the morning and i'm not going to exclusively limit this to the girls i see the guys pretty much making worse choices how many girls turn up to these, what would you call them, pseudo health food, um, fast food stores and get their Akai bowl or however the fuck you pronounce it, I don't give a fuck, get their Akai bowl that is like 800 calories and fuck all protein and a giant fucking latte, which is 800 calories, fuck all protein and walk away going, I've made a healthy, smart choice this morning and then wonder why they've got no fucking energy, wonder why they're skin shit wonder why they're irritable and they're not sleeping and wonder why they're hungry again at fucking 11 a.m. So what will they do? That quick morning break, they're out in Sainsbury's, Tesco, scrambling for those stupid fucking protein sources that are piss poor when their entire day and their entire environment could have been so, so much different if they just made a smarter choice for their breakfast alone, mm. alone. But they don't. Is... It, it just creates this knock-on environment. Is hunger something to be avoided when dieting? I think you'd have a tough fucking time getting into a calorie deficit <laughs> effectively if you tried and avoided hunger on a diet. Um, no, it's a natural, let's, let's not forget, hunger is a natural, based on two hormones, right? Hunger is an actual signal in your body that is kind of essential. If you never feel hunger, one or two things is happening. You're eating too much or that hormone's fucked. In which case, you know, you've got a lot of fucking work to do. Hunger for people, hungers. for people who don't understand the two hormones that uh, I'm going to go. There's certainly three, and there's this okay. that hormones mm. that do it. And so, and just a, a very quick overview because I've taught this twice in the last week to people, so sure. uh, to two groups of people, so I, I, I can condense it. So. What people think our body fat are, are unsightly things that are just on our gut or on our sides. But our adipose cells, which is where our fat is, our adipose tissue, is a fully fledged endocrine organ. And they produce a hormone called leptin. Now, people think leptin is a hunger hormone. 
Leptin isn't a hunger hormone. Leptin is your body's gossip queens. Right? It's the best <laughs> analogy ever had. So imagine here, right? Rob's got, let, let's say Rob spent six months, although he is looking chiseled today, I must say. You know, Rob spent six months overeating and he's got, so got a love handle, right? And he's, and he's fatter than you. He's, he's set points. We can talk set points another day. And so that means there's loads of leptin, loads of gossip queens being produced. And they'll go up to the hypothalamus in the brain and they'll basically go, ha ha, look how fat Rob is. And the brain's like, fuck this shit, man. I don't like the fact that they're gossiping about Rob. So he's going to send the bouncers, ghrelin and NPY, right, our hunger hormones. Right, ghrelin and NPY are going to ramp up hunger. And that's like the bouncers coming and chucking these leptin gossip queens out the house. Right, so, how, you know, um, so ghrelin and NPY will sort of go down if someone's really fat, to make sure their appetite's controlled, and their thyroid will go up to kind of kick some of these girls out, kick some of these gossip queens out. Gossip queens could be guys, let's say that. Guy. And then... Oh, this is terrible. Gossip gossip guys are even worse. Gossip, gossip, gossip them. So, so the gossip, gossip the gossip thems, right? So <laughs> lots of gossip thems, talk to the brain, brain goes, fuck this. He brings hunger down, brings thyroid up to bring you back to within your set. Now let's say mm-hmm. Rob then goes on a diet and he's now got less body fat and the brain's sitting there going, well, I haven't had any gossip thems come and chat to me for a while. Like it's, mm. it's a bit quiet. I don't, I don't like this. It's a bit eerie. So all, what he'll do is he'll slow thyroid down and then ramp up ghrelin and MPY to make you more hungry and eat more food to get you back within your set point. This is why people will get hungry and it's why it's one of the reasons why it's healthier to be slightly hungry when you go into a diet is making sure this mm. works well. Now, I know what some of you guys listening to this are going to think. You're going to think, well, why is it that I turn on TV and watch these American documentaries, these massively morbidly obese people, and they're eating 12 breakfasts? I was like, well, that's what we call leptin resistance. So that's like all these gossip thems. There's loads of them, right? Because they're morbidly obese. Like massive amounts of gossip thems going to the hypothalamus and like knocking on the door, shouting, all this sort of stuff. And it's like the hypothalamus has put on He's noise cancelling headphones. He's locked the door and he's like, right, I'm fed up of this. I'm just going to turn them off and not listen to them. So then eventually, as he's not listening to them for long enough, the brain goes, I'm not hearing anything. Mm. There's not obviously not many gossip them knocking on the door, but there is because you can't hear them. So he reacts like they're lean, even though they're not lean. That got you, didn't it? <laughs> but that's an overview of a politically correct overview oh of leptin and ghrelin and MPY. So at first, I was worried because you were you were misgendering hormones that are not gender specific <laughs> at all. Everyone has MPY, leptin, and ghrelin and, and insulin. <laughs> but then the fact that you corrected yourself and took ownership and continuously used gossip them without a blink of it, without you know a second thought or the blink of an I eye. I thought I thought I had um, to so I can join Sam Smith as a fisher. Then you've justified yourself. Like I love it. I love it. You, you brought you know you brought us back from the brink of being cancelled. Then we're fine now. Yeah, hail yeah God, heroes. God, God forbid, gossip them. Um, <laughs> so that's that's understanding hunger. And I think I think going back to the point, I think hunger on a like mm. there's a difference between hunger and starving. Yes. If you're starving on yes. a diet, this is something we need to work on. I mean, we need to look yeah. at things that will help this. We can go over this in a second. But I, I think some people they they are so they're so used to. I'm a bit hungry. I'll go grab something. It's that comfort factor. Bang! I've got mm. it. It's in the routine, it's in the diary, it's not in the diary, but it's in the fridge, it's in the cupboards, it's whatever. So teach people just to, look, you want a diet, sit with it. If you end up ravenously hungry, we can talk this, we can solve this issue, but like, you want a diet, you're gonna be a little bit hungry. And being able to sit with that and being okay with that is a huge positive Mm. skill, I think. Yeah, yeah, it takes you away from impulse. Because you have to remember the hunger, you're not gonna die, you're not gonna die. You're just on a diet. I know diet's in the fucking word. Some, you know, <laughs> some liberal trainer will say, well, this is why they call it diet, because you can die. No, you're not going to die. Like, because you're on, you're on a you're on a calorie-controlled... I'm just going to use the word diet because I like it. You're on a calorie-controlled diet, which, if you've chosen the right fucking coach to begin with, is going to sufficiently supply you with all the food that you need for optimal horno- hormonal environment depending how lean you're going to get and sustain your life and your enjoyment and keep everything ticking over nicely. Right. And what you're going to start noticing is signals that your body's always been sending since the moment you were born that you silenced through your habits, your choices, your environment, etc. that can be curbed 
without just instantly reaching for food. Because again, that that's the impulsive behavior that got you to where you were. When there's multiple ways you could have dealt with that hunger signal without reaching for food. Sometimes you didn't have to put anything in your mouth at all, apart from maybe water. But again, boredom, stress, <laughs> where, your, where your focus is, what your emotional response is, what your instant, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, well, yeah, same thing, like, emo, like an emotional response creates an emotional action. So maybe your emotional response to stress, to upset, to heartbreak, to pain in your life, the emotional action that you used was food, which is a legit fucking thing. It's how met, this is how way, way more people get into the obesity realm than this world's willing to admit. Yes. Because we like to, we like to pretend that these people aren't suffering, but they fucking are. So, and, and that's why some I hate people the, choose. Yeah, that's why I hate the people who, like, just again, we do, we, we say it, calorie deficit is important, progressive overload is important. Mm. I agree. And this is, but this is why, and I know I sound like I've been the unpath, unempathetic prick out of the two of us today, but I hate it when people just say calorie deficit, calorie deficit. Yes, no shit, Sherlock. But like, mm. people don't get fat because they show, like, there are the occasional big and beautiful person, but like, most people get fat because of struggles. Mental, yes. physical, mm. emotional mm. struggles. So mm. you need to create solutions for people. You need to yeah. empathize with people. And I just think, I think, I think it's getting lost. Yeah. The big, I know it's flipping topic slightly, but the big issue I have with um, the American Med Medical Association changing the definition of obesity to a disease takes away some sort of ownership because no one wakes up obese the next morning. It's a journey, right? But it certainly causes, as you get more and more overweight and into the obese category, it certainly creates disease-like factors within your body to the point where, yes, this condition you're in now could be considered like a disease because there's a lot of things you're going to have to do to reverse it and you are at severe risk of increased health factors and, well, pretty much death. I read an amazing thing yesterday. I never knew this, that... The five points over 25 on the BMI scale, for every additional five points you go over 25, you have an increased risk of 39% higher chance of death every five points you go over. It's an additional 39% each, each time. So if you think if someone's up at 45 on the BMI scale, that's a ticking time bomb, right? It's fucking terrifying. But I, uh, I digress. The, the issue I, I, with before, getting, you, before you digress, oh, go, go. though, before you yeah. digress, though, because I think that's interesting in terms of BMI scale. I know it's a different topic, but I want to throw a caveat out there because we listen. A lot of coaches listen to us, and a lot of coaches are going to say, "Well, BMI is rubbish because you know yeah, people have yeah. got more muscle yeah. mass, like are going to be clinically like obese or overweight." And mm -hmm. while I I I would incline to agree with that person in to a to a level in terms of a, like some people it's a bit skewed. Mm. Rich Piana, think of like. There's a lot of things going on, right? But how many bodybuilders have died of heart attacks, mm. which people are going to lay down to drugs, but how much of it's fact Ooh. that they are that level of points mm. over their BMI scale in a completely different way, that, mm. that that level of weight on the heart has an impact, whether you get it through yeah. muscle mass or obesity. I know that's a different topic Ooh. what you're talking about, but I just think it's an important no, no, caveat. It's, like it's BMI, BMI in the middle ground is a bit dicey, mm. right? People slightly yes. underweight and people slightly overweight. Yeah, but if the extremes, regardless of body composition, mm. there's mm. Valid validity here. Massively so. It's just, it's the, let's say it's entry level, right? It's entry mm. level. So, like you could say, well, calorie counting doesn't work, but it's just one method to get you into a calorie deficit. And to be fair, for some people, maybe it's not the first thing they do. Maybe they have to build on their habits and their food choices first that will lead to a calorie deficit that can lead to fat loss over time. But it doesn't mean calorie deficits, calorie counting, sorry, should be thrown out of the window as the method. So it doesn't mean we throw BMI out of the method. If you really want to understand these people who do go, well, was, my BMI was 30 and I'm, you know, fucking jacked. Well, it doesn't mean you're absent of obesity like risk factors. So what the, again, this is all in America because Britain's fucking 20 years behind everyone else. Um, the AAC, I forget which one it is. The America, I forget which one it is. Um, 
a couple of years ago with the Nadolski brothers actually reclassified what they use for the BMI going forward. Hmm. So they've got the BMI as the entry level, and then they have different stages, stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, et cetera. And like hypertension. Stage, and in hypertension, just like hypertension. Hmm. And with stage zero, it's your outside of the BMI with no obesity-related health factors, no high blood pressure, oh, no high funny. cholesterol, no fatty, sign of fatty liver oh, disease, thanks. no sign of, well, well, no sign of any of these factors, right? That's, That's stage zero, good. but you're outside of that BMI. So it takes the initial diagnosis, uh, the initial assessment, but puts, you, puts the individual at play, right? Because you can calculate your BMI online and it means nothing. Now it puts the individual at play. And then through the different stages, suddenly we're starting to see increased risk. But it doesn't mean that in stage zero that you can just stay there. Nadolski spoke about this himself very recently on a podcast of his I was listening to, where he was like pretty jacked as a wrestler. Um, and his BMI was like way over 28, maybe even above 30. And he was pretty lean, considered himself to be pretty healthy. But when he thinks back to it, he had severe sleep apnea that was all related to the amount of weight he was carrying. That's an obesity related factor. <clears throat> like that's not even that's stage nice. zero, that's stage one. So yeah, we can then start going deeper down this for the people that want to cry BMI is not relevant because they're all because apparently the UK population is jacked, so we need to not fucking worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're forgetting it's just it's just a fucking tool, right? It's just a tool. <laughs> that's um, what all. That's what all in terms of regular <laughs> break on the show. <laughs> but in, t in terms of, I've just remembered it because I went off. That was such a tangent, <clears throat> but. We can then think, right, okay, so these signals, it's, it's not just also based on your habits, your decisions, your environment. There is a lot of hormone-related um, uh, actions and responses that are created by this. So I think, and if anyone can correct me on this, please fucking do, because when it comes to this level of hormonal knowledge, mine compared to Simon's is buckle, absolutely buckle. But okay. I believe in terms of low, <laughs> low NPY, um, increased the amount of anxiety, I believe. It would make sense. So therefore, when you're high in anxiety, what you're going to try and do, you're going to reach for comfort things. Mm. And if you also look at things like... Which creates another hormonal response. If you, you, yeah, you, you also think insulin cause of an inverse relationship as well, right? So in particular, high peers of high stress. Right. The reason why we go for sugary yes. foods is that when cortisol goes up, insulin tends to go down. Mm. Mm. Um, yeah. Which makes sense as one's a storage hormone, one's a breaking down it's hormone, balanced. right? So they, yeah, it's, it's balanced. They dance with each other. It's, it's, it's something you've got to consider, but obviously if you're just looking to lose a few pounds, don't go too deep down the rabbit hole. But you have to recognize that, again, it's not just one there is no one size fits all. There really fucking isn't. You know? Bringing this back to um, the low calorie, low carb argument. We're going to do a low yeah, calorie first. Yeah. When are the times where going on a grind and pushing calories hard, pushing a big deficit, when is that a good thing? If you are the type A personality where you can consistently go on an aggressive approach because you have a short time frame to work with, and maybe you have one of two things, a history of successful dieting or a coach, a reputable coach to guide you through the process that has ideally been there themselves. That's where the aggressive deficits can work. But there is argument for aggressive deficits in the obese community as well, as long as hunger is managed well, not, more often than not through medication. We can talk about that another day. Um, but there's efficacy behind that as well. So there are, there are different calls for it, but the issue is, again, like a large percentage of the population see that as the way to go, the path. So I have to go super fucking restrictive, which in a way you could class as optimal because we know it's going to fucking work, but it's not going to work a long time based on your responses, your hormonal environment, your actual environment, your habits, your decisions, your behaviors. Those things have to be taken into account as well. But as we've experienced through many, many clients, there are some people that you can just give them that boot camp instructor style approach and it works for them. Keeps it on track. But it's not for everyone. I'm going to go in a little bit of the pro aggressive diet side of this argument. Sweet. 
And I think it's because we've overcorrected. Mm. I think we've gone through, as you said, so many people think that was the way forward. There were so many transformation companies mm. and so many coaches given these aggressive diets that now we see coach all the time, yeah. like coaches with, I agree, also add zero results. Talk about like, <laughs> oh, these things are terrible. These things are bad. You've got to go on a small deficit. And I yeah. think there are two very specific places where low calorie dieting is the right approach. So the second one, I'm going to come back to the first one. The second one is like you said, it's the type A personality that's got a short time frame. I would reword that in the sense, not reword it because I think your points are absolutely valid, but I, I, in my interpretation of that is someone's health markers are in a good place where they're healthy enough to push hard. They have sure. a short time frame and a clear deadline of how long they're going to go for. So, you know, we're going to go for this short period of time and then we're going to pull back. Aggressive to pull back. Totally fine with that. Um, sometimes you need to, right? But the other thing that people don't consider, people think that it is more sustainable to do a small deficit, find maintenance calories and take 300 calories off with a beginner starting. Yeah. Here's my problem with that. Problem one. All we are doing as coaches is creating an educated guess. What if your guess is wrong and your client doesn't lose any weight in the first three weeks? Yeah. You've lost the buy-in. Number, uh, problem number two, people suck at tracking. So they're going to end a report on calories. If they've only got a 300 calorie margin of error, they're going to go over the calories. So what you think about what's on paper, this is for on paper supposedly here, but what people say on paper, someone's calories, what they actually are, are different. So that if you went more aggressive, you have an argument then of they have a thousand calories to fall in, then they're actually probably at the closer to that 500 calorie deficit than you're mm. aiming for. Um, also, we've got to think of the fact that point three, the reason why I think a low carb diet, a low calorie diet is good for the, not low carb, but a low calorie diet is good for the start, is that most people's 3,000, 4,000 calories are off hot, low volume, high calorie dense foods. If you now put them on 2,700 calories of high voluminous foods, they're probably going to get digestive upset. They're probably going to struggle mm. to eat it and they're going to feel like a failure. You're back to losing Ooh. the buy in, right? Yeah. Um, and Number four is that people don't appreciate when you're looking at research of habit change, when you look at research of habit change, people underestimate how much, or just don't even know, how much momentum plays a huge role in behavior change. If I yeah. could do something and it goes, oh my God, I've lost three, four kilos. Yeah, we know it's glycogen or water retention, but the client doesn't. And the client goes, oh my God, this works. So when you make further adjustments or tailor that deficit down to a more manageable level long term, they're more likely to stick to it because they believe in the process. Yeah. So I think for all of those reasons, and probably some I've, I've forgotten off the top of my head now, I think starting people on a lower calorie approach is is a good way. I also think it builds the foundations. So you yeah. can bring someone down to, if I'm just taking their normal diet and taking 300 calories off, their normal diet is no structure. If I bring it back to, okay, let's get protein target, let's get some vegetables, let's make sure you drink some water. If you can't fill it with the rest or loads of other stuff, it's easy to hit those because you have no other option. And then we can add stuff on top and build it around you, build your diet around you. Strike while you're motivated, get the foundation in place, and then tailor it as the motivation naturally drops off. You can make the diet easier, not harder. And I think starting low early on for most beginners is a good way, shape, or form. And I, I know I'm, 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 yeah. I'm hammering this point home, yeah. but the argument that some people are going to say, well, but you'll lose muscle mass. They're a beginner. They're going to gain muscle mass no matter what you do. <laughs> also, how much muscle mass have they got to lose? Most of people haven't set foot in the gym in their life. If I exactly. took you, Rob, I wouldn't put you in a thousand calorie deficit. I would put you in a smaller deficit because you probably track your calories or at least know roughly what you're on. You train hard. You've had some muscle, lots of training experience. So you, I, you, I would need to fuel that session. If I'm fueling yeah. a training session that looks like you're bouncing on a bouncy castle, there's no point. That's my argument. That's my rant. <laughs> <laughs> but that's tr like, there's so many things to take out of that, right? In terms of, let's not forget, someone's, someone's exercise and recovery will be fueled by the excessive amount of fat that they're carrying. So the body's not automatically going to go, oh, shit, well, he's, on, he's in an aggressive deficit. We'd better burn all our protein. No, there's an excessive and easily accessible fuel that it's going to go to first. It's going to go to. 
You're not going to be will, losing muscle you mass. Would go to, you would go to your muscle mass if you have some to lose because it's easier to convert protein into uh, glucose if you're doing high intensity than it is fat into glucose. But if you're consuming enough protein, it's going to go to the if amino acids coming protein. in through the diet, not to the ones on your biceps. Exactly. Yes, exactly. If, so that's the key thing there, if you're consuming enough protein. The other thing to remember is the biggest problem I see with the, the low, uh, sorry, with the very, very small deficit approach is the, the big argument they make is, well, doing it this way, you're not going to screw up your hormones because if you go into an aggressive deficit, you're not going to have, you know, I, for, I forget which ones, but the ones that produce your period and your testosterone is going to plummet and all this. But if you're, over, if you're in that overweight category, if you're above 20%, your hormones are kind of fucked anyway. So by dropping into a lower body fat percentage through any method is actually going to create a better hormonal environment first before you have to worry about entering the, the negative hormone environment from being too lean or being in too deep of a deficit. I, but I, how fragile do coaches think people are? People's hormonal systems This is the are. problem. Everyone's too fucking soft. That's what we're like, talking about before we hit record. But, Everyone's yeah, but, but like <clears throat> hormones, like, right, right. Here's another, I'm going to use another <laughs> analogy here, right? And it doesn't have any thems in it this time, right? Um, <laughs> I always consider hormonal output like a race car. Right? So you're the race car, and the fuel in your race car is your hormones. Right? Cool. So you're racing around in this race car, and you don't all of a sudden just go around a corner, and then all the petrol just evaporates in one go, and you go and street to a halt. You will start to slow down. You'll hear a splutter or two. You'll feel a few engine groans, and you will just gradually, gradually, slowly come into a halt. If I took your calories tomorrow and took them to 500, right, you wouldn't just trash your thyroid. Otherwise, people fasting would fuck themselves over year round, right? Yeah. So it's people think when people are fragile, oh, I'll give someone 1,200 calories, they're immediately going to lose their thyroid output. No, they're not. And you'd see things. You'd see a lack of energy. You'd see low body temperature. You'd see sluggishness and everything that you yeah. do. Way before it actually got to a point where it's a, it's a real problem, it, the, yeah. the problem is long-term low calorie. Yeah. Not mm. the fact that, oh, my God, you, you went from – 1201 calories to 1199 that means you must now be fucked like <laughs> get real <laughs> and let's not forget we're together this is why the industry is so soft they're scared to put people into this realm because they've never been there themselves and they've never taken a client there themselves you have to remember in an aggressive deficit you are likely to be using strategic refeeds whereas at the opposite which is going to make you feel better which is you know a little boost in hormones etc but at the opposite end of the spectrum, the ones who are too scared to go there, it's, well, here's how you can lose weight while still eating the food you love. That's a slow fucking approach. And, and again, once you buy into their program, you're not eating the foods you love. If you love fucking pizza and they're teaching you how to make it on a tortilla wrap, <laughs> it's not fucking pizza, is it? You know, there's no way near What's the lowest like... calories you've been on in a diet? What's the lowest well, calories you've been on in a diet? I got told off... Um, by old management for going closer to 1350. 1100. 1350. Oh, bruv. You got and a lot fucking late. This is why term. I didn't get late. Mm. Yeah, this is yeah. three, four weeks, right? Yeah. And I just suck it up. Like, it's <laughs> not. I had, a, I had a strict goal. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say yeah. I'm going to do 1100 next week. Like that's the smart way to die. Like, no, yeah. this is, this is, I had a, this is um, category two. I was talking about I had three weeks for a photo shoot. I wanted to get as lean as humanly possible. I wanted to be so scary. You could probably see my kidneys do my thoraco lumbar fascia. So I just, it, I need, it needed to be done. Yeah. So if you want to yeah. get men's health cover model lean, you kind of need to go through those periods. Otherwise, it's not realistic. Yeah. It's not a realistic no. goal now. So mm. it doesn't mean you have to go as aggressive as that. But I'm just saying, like, if you, if you, if you, want, if you think this is a comfortable goal, it, it isn't. Mm. And everybody would be walking around with a six-pack if it was. Yeah. And I just think that, that the people, like, coaches need that wake-up call as much as clients. Like, yeah. As long as they're healthy, if you have a time frame and a strict deadline and the guy that has the desire, push. If you yeah. keep them on it for a year and you're not looking at, for symptoms that it's going, then you're an idiot. But yeah. if, all, if you are, you're not going to break somebody. It's like people not deadlifting because they're worried that the back's going to break. Or I picked up a newspaper, my back went, how heavy is the newspaper? It's, we assume our clients are more fragile than they are. 
if clients want to yeah. push, you're doing a disservice by not pushing them. You just need to monitor it. Yeah. This, uh, this is a big problem with like, re-referencing the low-carb, low-calorie hacks and stupid things like that. Is they're pushed by a majority of trainers who, again, are also pushing this slow method. So if you're going to take 200 calories away from someone, but also give them a ton of low-carb, low-calorie hacks, they're instantly going to go into a deeper deficit because you've given them a low-calorie fucking option, which means somewhere else, if, they, if they've then got to hit that, that, that um, 200 calorie deficit target, whatever the hell, they're, they're going to have to get more food in from somewhere else anyway, in which case, what was the fucking point of ever giving them these hacks? Just teach them how to eat real food the, the correct way. And even then, there's, there's a time and a place for these hacks, and I don't think it's in the beginning stages of someone's diet in the fucking slightest. It become less impactful if you do it early on. But I, I yeah. also think Massive from response. the coach's listener's perspective, right, if, you, if you're one of these guys mm. who preach a slow, steady approach, then, okay, there's a market mm. for that. But you need to be an expert at that. I had Tobias yeah. from Tobias Lifestyle on, on the podcast mm. last week. Yeah. And he is a expert on habits. So he helps people overcome habits. So yeah. if you want to do the slow, steady approach, your market is people that have failed diet before, the people that have emotional connections to food, and yeah. you need to be a master of psychology. You need to be able to help them slowly build towards those things. And if that yeah. is the case, then you are the slow, steady man, and I have all power to you. What I find is that a lot of slow, steady people are people that want to put a six pack transformation on their, on their profile yeah, and are, are surprised why they don't get them. It's like, well, because you're not pushing yeah. the clients enough to get them. And, yeah. and the, I'm not saying that the way I do things is, is right for your business, but you need to understand what you want from your clients. If you want a slow, steady, yeah. I've lost five pounds. Well, I've lost 10 kilos within three years. That's cool. That's a great yeah. thing. Like anyone who's lost 10 kilos of a healthy is fantastic. Yeah. But understand your marketing's not going to look the way that RNT yeah. Fitness or Ultimate Performance or insert transformation company here mm. is going to look. And, mm. and if that's your niche, then fine. But don't try mm. and think about, okay, what we'll do is week one, we'll just tell you to have an omega-3 fish oil and do some <laughs> breath work. And then week yeah. two, we'll maybe add a thumb of protein with dinner. I'm like... If you want a transformation, <laughs> it's got to be oh, it's got to be a push. Oh, this one's been amazing. This is been fucking incredible. <laughs> Wait, you're fucking right. You're, you're right. In terms of what people need, it's a calorie deficit. Multiple ways to get into it. But again, we're too worried about being lifestyle coaches. So yes, we're trying to put all these recovery methods in when people haven't even fucking trained hard. So let's quit that fucking bullshit. But there was a stat. I'm trying to find it because I took a screenshot. I thought it was really fucking relevant. Um, here we go. So in terms of people that were surveyed at the start of the year, I don't know the, the pool size. 62% of people had a goal to lose an average of 22 pounds in 2023. Right. So a decent amount of weight, but for a large percentage of people, it's certainly not going to be life changing either. Right. But 58% of those people recognize their weight loss goals as ambitious. Like, you're fucking kidding me. Over half of the people who have said they want to lose 22 pounds in 2023, over half of them think that's too ambitious. It means they have absolutely no idea what's possible when you are pushed correctly. Like, okay, the slow, steady approach, a lot of respect for it, right? I get it. I kind of see what you're trying to do, but I also think it's misguided. What we've seen people do in 12 weeks, 24 weeks, 36 weeks, 45 weeks in under a year is nothing short of phenomenal. And a decent percentage of people can achieve that when they invest in the right coaching, when they follow the right methods, which includes different phases of nutrition and training. You're not going to get to, like I say, you're not going to get to uh, what causes you to drop five pounds is not going to be the method that causes you to drop 50 pounds. It's not. There's going to be differences. So what is possible is not classed as, is not what I would class as ambitious. Not at all. And, but what we've seen people achieve in that initial conversation, we're not necessarily using the language of six pack or 52 kilos later. We're focusing on the first steps. Let's get you moving. Let's get you educated about your food. Let's learn how to deal with hunger and stress 
and focusing on your sleep, which is only going to have knock-on benefits to make those other things easier as well. Like to, to think that these ideas are ambitious is, I'm never going to knock someone that takes three years to lose 10 kilos. Absolutely not. Never. Absolutely not. Mad fucking respect for you. But you could have done it faster. You could have. Of course you could have. I think, we, I think there's two things, to, to there's two things that. that's important for this um, with coaches. And I think the first mm. one is that understanding that expectation management is, 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 your, yes. is, is the, one of the biggest skills you can have, right? And if you want big results, you need big actions. And your mm. clients need to know this from the off. If you want big mm. results, you're going to need to take big action. Yeah. If you want steady results, you can take steady actions. But you can't take steady results and get big. You can't take steady actions and get big results. No. So it's you need to set that groundwork of what do you what do you and your client want? What do your client want? That's most important, not what you want. What does your client want? And what are the what what is the absolute non negotiables of what they need to do to get there? I, I think you can be as flexible as you like on the approach, but you can never be flexible on the goals. If this is the amount of activity and this is the deficit we need, we that there's there's no wiggle room. But the, the, there is ultimate wiggle room in how we get to that point. And I yes. see clients all the time pulling back. Oh, it's okay. Maybe you don't need to weigh something day. Okay, maybe maybe you can just have like a smaller deficit. And then you never tell them that the results are going to be compromised by doing that because they're just mm. trying to be liked. And I'm like, look, you yeah. need big action. And at some yeah. point, it's going to hit. You're going to hit a comfort zone wall, and you're going to fight this. And I'm going to push through it. Or we do slower, and we might not hit that wall, but understand that it'll be slower. I do not care. Which one you do? Mm. This is your journey. If this is a Harry Potter story. Yeah. You are Harry. I am Dumbledore. Yeah, but it's. it's I think you're. I'm. Yeah. I'm one hundred percent. I don't know if my my earlier statement. That's the wrong word. Um, made it look like I'm not a fan of the aggressive deficit at all, because most people I'm putting over five hundred calories. Most people I'm putting mm. over a five hundred calorie deficit. Um, because I know it fucking works. And I know we can still work with your lifestyle and your factors and things like that. Um, fuck, what was the point I was going to make? Uh, but the, 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 the slow strategy people, when they post a result, and again, I'm not going to knock anyone that loses five fucking pounds. I'm not. If you've lost something, fuck it. Or if you're at least trying, fair fucking play to you. But the big issue we see, we've seen results, right? Like you've said, you wanted to get to the point where you saw your kid. You wanted to get to the point where we could definitely tell if you were a biological male or female from, could you see your uterus <laughs> popping through your fucking abs, right? But <laughs> some people post their transformation of a female and she's just lost a little bit of bloating. That's all it is. Probably In 12 through, weeks, they've stepped back yeah. and they've held a newspaper. Yeah, or oh, that too, right? But we've seen, we've seen if someone, if, if a female starts making better nutritional choices and focuses on their sleep a little bit more and limits their stress a little bit more, without ever stepping on the scale, they should look a little bit different, different 12 weeks down the line because bloating should have definitely subsided based on what they were eating and what their habits were beforehand. That's not a transformation, right? So you, you then look at the rest of the body and go, mm, it was not a transformation. There's a specific transformation, right? Yeah, okay, you've helped them. You've helped them in some way, shape, or form. But that's certainly not the end fucking result. You How, can't tell me that blowing your trumpet, I, or, mm. or making us sound like we're amazing fat loss coaches, how many results have you got that are all right? Yeah, people lose 5, 10 kilos and all sorts of things that are good. So as I was saying before, my electricity decided to completely blow off, hence why I look a little bit darker and grainier for people watching on YouTube, is like how many, um, without blowing our own trumpets, how many results have you got that are good results? Like, you know, like five, 10 kilos results that you, you'll, they will never be posted online. Not because they aren't good, mm. they just aren't amazing. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, a, a, a larger percentage than my 20 to 30 kilo weight loss clients, result clients, a lot, much larger percentage. And I think, I think there needs to be that, that coaches need to have that sort of like understanding of what a result is. And I'm not saying yeah. that you shan't, shouldn't post success stories of people that feel amazing, but like, I think just hold off sometimes because all it does mm. from a coach perspective, sometimes it makes your business look average. And mm. not every result has to be shredded six pack, but every result has to be yeah. worth the investment that you're charging them. So if, if you charge mm. for a very expensive high ticket product, 
your results should show a high ticket product, which means either a huge change in mentality or a, um, either a huge change in mentality or a huge change in visual appearance. Mm, massively so. So to go, not, uh, go, on. Go, 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 go. I was just no, going to bring it back to boot camp. I don't want to knock people too hard, but when all a coach posts is the most relevant marketable weekly wins that their clients have achieved in their Instagram stories, rather than actually posting results, kind of shows you're not getting results. Granted, I love checking in. I do the same with my clients. What are some wins this week? What are some struggles? What do we need to work on? But let's celebrate your wins as well. But if that's all you fucking post, it kind of shows behind the scenes what's happening. Because if someone is looking at your business and they want to, like if I, if I were to invest in another business coach that was going to get me to X amount of money per fucking month and they could show me genuine results, cool. If all they ever showed me on the Instagram stories was a weekly check-in and people going, well, yeah, I had a few more conversations this week. I got to bed on time. Energy's feeling pretty good. I'm not going to fucking invest in that geezer. I want to know, can he get me the fucking financial result I'm looking for? Not are his clients happy just tugging along in kind of mediocrity. And this is why wanna... I'm, not, I'm not scratching at anyone that feels better. Like the, yeah. the aim essentially is we want people to feel better. But mm. like, don't think that, that your clients are paying thousands of pounds to feel better. They would get a therapist. And... It's, it's, you've got to show, you've got to show true tangible results. But going back to the topic, before yeah. we go and finish off with the hacks, I want to talk about something that there's a way old school mentality now. And I think, it, I think there's an argument for it to kind of be brought back. I'm going to tell you my story with it first. And that's the low carb boot camp. So for people who don't know what the low carb boot camp is, it's a Charles Poliquin thing where you do two weeks two to four weeks of no cops, just vegetables, protein targets. Um, and then once you've um, done that, you start reintroducing carbohydrates. The aim here is you remove a lot of common inflammatory foods, um, you remove inflammation, and then you almost like what Charles would call it, earn your carbs. And our, our old company used to do it quite religiously with people, right? Got great results. And then I left and I was like, I'm not gonna do that. I don't need it, you don't need it. You can lose weight with carbohydrates. And I very much agree you can. And I look now and I think, do you know what? I think there's a place for it with a beginner client. I think a lot of people spend too long eating foods that don't agree with our digestive system, which is always going to mean that we're not absorbing as much of the food as we want to, which is going <clears> to <throat> hinder muscle building results, which is going to hinder fat loss results. We're always getting an inflammatory response. Mm. I also think it separates the men from the boys and the theys from the thems to have to, to, to have two weeks where it is going to be hard. If someone can follow a low carb boot camp for two weeks, mm. they, can, they, they will follow anything. And you know the people that are ready to go. And the people are yeah. struggling with that, you can pull them back. You know, you know that's the slow and steady client. Was the client that yeah. does the low carb boot camp, I think it's a, like, they, they, you know they're ready to go. They're ready to rock and roll. And as we spoke about with the low calorie thing, it builds the foundations. So if you're only going to eat protein and vegetables, you always mm. get your protein target. You always get enough vegetables yeah. and then I can put a bowl of rice or a bagel on top of that. And yeah. awesome. Yeah. What do you think of the it, low carb boot camp? It rewires so many other things. Take away just fat. Well, not even fat loss. Take away weight loss from the, from the potential result of a low carb boot camp. But what it does for you in terms of your behaviors and your choices and your education of how you can still feed yourself in a day without the carbs and the inflammatory foods you've been eating and still feel fucking amazing. But it also takes away the decision. Well, it takes away the power that these junky carbs you've been eating has over you or that habit has over you. This is the start of behavioral change by going on that low carb boot camp. Some people struggle with it a lot longer, a lot harder than others. Maybe there's the, the argument that those people need it for four weeks rather than two weeks. Maybe. But in terms of what it can do in, in reminding you of what decent food actually fucking tastes like as well, I will yeah. never forget this client, Ahmed. I'll <clears> never <throat> forget two clients, Ahmed and Rob. Ahmed was already pretty fucking lean. Um, but it's to, to get to the 6.9% that he ended up at, He's not eating a lot of food, right? So there came a point where we're like, 
his his energy was shit. His digestion had gone. So it's time for a refeed, right? And I told him, using using the old school methods, go have a bowl of oats with banana in it, with syrup in it, when everyone else would, you know, their refeed is pizza day and eating the food you love. Like, we kept it very, very strict. He came in the next morning like a new man, and he went, that was the most beautiful bowl of porridge I've ever had. And at first, I was worried. I was like, shit, what else did he put in this bowl of porridge? He had it exactly measured out as we, as I told him to. And he came in, A, energy for the fucking road, feeling amazing. But in terms of reminding himself that all it took was oats, honey or syrup, whatever it was we went for, and a bit of fruit. And it was tasty and satisfying and fucking amazing when he hadn't had it for X amount of time. And I had another client, Rob, who um, calorie counting, tracking, all this stuff was completely alien and new to him. And it took him a little bit longer to get the handle of it. What he can do now is absolutely phenomenal. We don't need to track calories. He just nails it on site. It's incredible through the time and the education that he's invested in it. There was a moment where he kind of got caught up with some of the things of what other people were saying, like about fruit and sugar and glucose and fructose. And I, I came across the fact that he wasn't eating fruit. I was like, mate, you can have two servings of fruit a day easily, easily. You can have fucking more if you want. And again, like I saw him like the next week, whatever it was, and all he had done was started eating blueberries every single day. And the joy he was experiencing from, oh, my God, they were the nicest blueberries ever. Well, they weren't. They were just blueberries. They taste the same all fucking year round. <laughs> You've just reminded yourself what actual decent nutritional sweet food tastes like. So you don't, you can easily get the same satisfaction without having to go for these carbs. And we've taught you that just by eliminating them for a short period of time. That was one of the biggest pros to that low carb boot camp that I ever experienced with clients mm. was when they actually realized, well, I can add in normal carbs and they taste fucking amazing. And what you can do with protein and veg sources to make a decent, tasty fucking meal that is going to keep you satisfied and full and still provide you with energy for training and day-to-day -day life and all that stuff as well. That I'm still a big advocate of it. I don't give it to everyone, but I still give it. I still use it. I, I think as well, it's, it's easy, right? You mm. know, if someone's new to calorie tracking, just go, okay, protein and vegetables, two weeks. Yeah. They, they, they're going to get in a deficit. And it's not going yeah. to think about it when they want to meal out. Easy. It's this easy yeah. thing to do, right? And I think... As long as you said, as long as you come out of this at some point, you don't make them fear carbs. I think it's a sort of good option here. Mm. What's the biggest mistake? Like really a one inch. What's the biggest mistake you feel people make when they go low carb? If anyone wants to try this, what's the biggest mistake mm. people make? Uh, one of the biggest is, well, two, two of them is, again, they might then get in this mentality of let's try and implement some of these um, processed food sources that are ultra low calorie and low carb because that will make it feel like no 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 we've got to this is like go i don't want to say go in the trenches but i'm gonna say this is going into the trenches for a little bit there's gonna be some hard work let's let's use this short period of time for some actual effort and hard work right um you're not gonna suffer you're not gonna die so then adding all these things into their diet they're just gonna cause as much inflammation and water retention and whatever else anyway and not be as satisfying and potentially, you know, mess around with your sweet tooth as well. Um, but the other one is then going super low carb on everything else and thinking it's just protein. Like you could, as Polyquin has said in, in articles before, that you could just eat cod and veg on the old school <laughs> fish and a rice cake, but without a rice cake. Where's your, where's your fucking fat coming from, you know? You've still got to get, like you'll have targets to follow if you want to do this low carb boot camp properly. You'll have targets to follow. Um, and and it doesn't mean you're going to be eating tiny fucking portions of food. Hmm. Like your I plate think, should be full of yes. veg. Full. I think the biggest mistake that I see people make, because one of the things people go low carb and immediately come in and go, I'm lacking energy. Mm. And mm. my thing with this is that when people think carbs are energy, they're, they, they, they're not wrong, but they they don't truly understand it. So mm. carbs being energy, they're the fuel training. Like there's glucose to fuel high intensity activity. It's not necessarily mental energy. And a lot of times when people yeah. like carbs actually release serotonin and calm you down. So people yeah. go on a local diet and think, oh, it's, it's, it's the carbs the reason why I feel tired. What's normally happened is that someone's also taken sodium 
because salt's got such a bad rap from yes. the medical yes. community where the problem often is if someone's eaten uber processed food, you can have tons of sodium and that could cause issues with the heart, but it's often a lack of potassium. These people who eat lots of processed food, often eat very little vegetables, don't really have much in the way of electrolytes, aren't very well hydrated. So if you go low carb, make sure you're salting your meals. I promise you, you will feel better doing it. Massively so. Huge thing. I think that was, maybe it was an old Pelican thing. I think that's a bit of big thing people have to watch. And there was another, um, sorry, it was Lar McDonald. His, what was it called? Not extreme fat loss. Ultimate Diet 2.0? Or there was the aggressive uh, extreme diet handbook or something like that. Something like that. And the big, scientific big, approach big... to crash dieting. Close, close. It was. I think it was literally just like the extreme fat loss guy. It was something stupid like that. That it was literally like a four to five day protocol, something like that. Ultimate um, Diet Two Point was five days low calorie, low carb, low fat, um, and then it was two mega refeed days. So this were this was another very very small book um, that was a subset of that protocol for a ra rapid a rapid fat loss. Guide, whatever the fuck. What do you call your books, Lyle? Come on. Rapid Fat Loss Handbook. Rapid Fat Loss Handbook. So it was like, again, like a, a subset of the ultimate diet, but going deeper into a very, very short phase, which was essentially a very, very low carb boot camp. Uh, pretty much a low fat boot camp as well. And there was like an entire chapter dedicated to sodium and potassium balance. Because if there was anything that was going to fuck you up, it was that. It wasn't the lack of carbs, it wasn't the lack of fat. It was the imbalance in your sodium and potassium levels you'd suddenly experience that week. So making sure that you took you took in the right I think I swear there was amounts as well. I swear I put amounts in there. Taking the right amount of sodium and potassium at the same time. Um to maintain that balance for, you know, blood pressure, making sure you're not fainting, shit like that. All these other things we need these vital minerals for that a certain subsect of <laughs> the health industry is saying don't don't have salt. Um and obviously, there's multiple types of salt as well. Um, it's so fucking important, which is why you can't, again, you can't just do these things on your own. You can't just hear low carb boot camp. What's that? Two weeks low carb. Right, cool. I'm going to do that. This is why coaching is so important with people who have been there before, because there are extra little things you've got to worry about that can screw your progress up quite badly. So That's going huge. on to the, 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 the little things and giving a little bit of our coaching wisdom to people, mm. let's finish off with the... We've both been on diets, we've both gotten lean, we've both done photo shoots. Mm. Let's go one at a time. Name me something that's kept you going. This can be relatively quick fire, but one thing that you found has been a game changer, a little hack for your diet. <laughs> the simplest fucking thing in the world, which some people are going to argue because it's processed food. Uh, cheese slices, American cheese slices, was a surprisingly <laughs> easy and delicious way to add volume and enjoyment to my meal with very, very, very low, low calories added to it. I fucking lived off them almost. I'm going to agree on that. And I'm also going to like, I'm going to piggyback on yours because you reminded me of one that I hadn't got on my list. The like low calorie, like the five to 10 calorie dairy lead triangles. And the roots, oh, they, mm. are they, they're not, they're, like, they're, they're low calorie, but they're not quite low calorie for the tininess of them. But you know what they yeah. were really good at? Is if I had like a, big gap between a meal and I just need something just to tie me over. Not, not Thanks. fill me up, but just keep yeah. me going until dinner. Yeah. That was great. Just one of them. And it was just perfect. It just yeah. kept me, it, I was still mm. hungry, but it just took the edge off it. Yeah. To, but to be fair, I think, I mean, I said I'd, I'd, I'd live off them. I'd live off them because they're delicious, but I know there's not a lot of actual nutrition in there. Maybe no more than two per day. And I'd be having it with breakfast on top of my eggs more often than not such a simple thing and, and again it turned it turned what could have been a potentially boring meal with my mindset at the time into something so fucking enjoyable mm. and you again you feel like you're being a little bit naughty and you're not really oh yeah two mm. fucking cheese slices not it's not going to kill anyone i've grouped mine so i've got four categories mm. i'm going to just list a few cool. off mm. so my first one is the simplicity hacks so how do you make your diet easy this is if you get caught out and you've not got your prep food or um or you want to be able to be accurate with your diet, but you don't want to weigh everything. So and in the list, 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 I've got packet meats, it's like Mark's mm. best packet chicken. Yes. Muller rice, Huge. bagels, 
and serine loaves. Now, Ooh. what all these do is Ooh. the packet meat's obviously just protein, right? And yeah. you, can, you can do it by what's on there. And all the other options are what I found, because generally my diet, I, I tend to respond well with higher carb, lower fat diets for the most part. Um, unless I want to get over some digestive issues. Right. Um, so I've done a lot of research when I was in the UK dieting of what was what options could I have that were high in carbs but low in fats. So I right. found all these things that I could have if I wanted to add carbs to my diets, and I found these things I wanted to do to add fats into my diet without any carbs. And I think Muller rices, nice, sweet, they were always came in a uniform size, same with the little serene loaves, same with a bagel, right. and mm. it was just simple and effective. Any simplicity hacks that you like you have, such so to piggyback on mine before we go on to your next one. Anything you found that's helped you keep things simple? So, certainly in terms of like that that meal prepping right there. Your the good the good thing in there is you've gone for a majority of low fat sources. Now, based on multiple reasons, one of which you said you seem to do better on it. But again, when people eat uh, suffer with their meal prep or have to eat out and they go to make these you know, impulse decisions in M&S or Sainsbury's, whatever, they're going for the thing that also includes a lot of fucking fat. It's so over, what you easy to overeat on fats. Exactly. So therefore, you could have gone for some protein and carby and ended up with less calories overall if you had gone for the lower fat sources. So there is definitely advocacy for choosing the, the protein and carbs when you're out rather than trying to keep it all low carb. That, that, hmm. that could be a losing battle. Um in terms of simplicity hacks, it's a good one. Mate, for, for, for me, this kind of comes under simplicity. But flavor is one of the biggest hacks you can make on a fucking diet. And you can achieve that with little to zero calories through the use of herbs, spices, or my go-to saviors, whether I'm, and I'll have them whether I'm dieting or not, hot sauce and salsa. Hot sauce and salsa makes any meal taste fucking amazing with negligible calories added to them, like probably mm. less than 10, right? So in which case it's not going to do any damage whatsoever, and I'm going to enjoy the hell out of that meal. If I accidentally make it boring, I'm not going to want to eat it, in which case then those cravings come in, not because you're <laughs> experiencing low nutrition or anything, it's because you've not enjoyed the thing that you've eaten, and you need some element of comfort coming from it as well. It's the simplest fucking thing in the world is put some goddamn flavor in your food. Yeah. I, I, my flavor snacks was one of mine, and I had my, in my cool. flavor snacks. I That's had cool. obviously like yeah. everyone says herbs and spices, right? Yeah. And in my yeah. group, I have like a, in my little book that I send to people, I have like a make your own sort of like spice mix and keep it easy. Love it. But Love it. Things I like, here's the two I think I, I would consider hacks. One is not as good as the other. The first one is horseradish. Low oh. calorie. Uh, flavoursome, but you can't have too much of it. So it's not going to work well on a bland chicken breast if you're going to have white meat, right? Because you can't put a lot on it unless it'll go up your nose and you'll start crying. But Frank's buffalo sauce, not Frank's hot sauce, because the buffalo. problem with Frank's hot sauce is if it's tabasco you can't put much on. But the buffalo, yeah. you can drench buffalo your chicken in. legit the best fucking sauce on the market. By far. By far, yeah. mate. Yeah. What's your, what's your next one? Uh, that's what did I say? So the two slices of the flavour. And again, like, don't... Don't underestimate the sheer size of what a low-calorie meal can look like. In terms of chucking a proper, proper salad together, which the word sounds boring, but if you chuck a proper salad of the ingredients you actually fucking enjoy with a decent amount of protein on there, it can keep you so fucking full that you, you almost barely fucking eat it as well. And that could yeah. be, and you get tons of fucking nutrition in there, and you're satisfied. So when people go for these piddly fucking salads, or they grab a salad from prep, this is where things start going wrong. If you took the time to make that yourself, in terms of how low calorie that can be, but massive, is is mind blowing. It's mind like you're blowing. setting me up for my categories because I, I, you set me up for the flavour one, you set me up for the volume hacks. So my first one in the volume hack section was veg over salad. I see a lot of people getting like leaves and like going, why am I still yeah. so hungry? It's like, throw something <laughs> in there, right? But I, I yeah. appreciate that's a boring one. So I want to add another couple of suggestions. And yeah. the first one is melon. <laughs> now, this is, this is I, I'll sure. admit, this is not my diet hack. I'm going to credit a yeah. guy called James Chester, who I work with for this. I, I wow. personally don't particularly like 
melon. Um, but it's so voluminous. If you want something mm. that's going to have hardly any calories and it's going to be massive, that's going to be good. And my yeah. last one on that volume section is going to, is a bit, it's going jumping into the bodybuilding world and it's cream of rice. Yeah. Because yeah. I know everyone got into the cream of rice thing, but i tell you what, you put a couple of scoops of protein powder, so a couple of scoops of cream of rice, right? I get it. It's high carb, maybe it's not for everybody there, but it's a low fat, high carb option. And you can, it, it, you can make a bowl of oats and it's all right. It's filling. You can make a bowl of cream of rice and it's like three times the size. It's crazy. I used to have a, I used to have a protein powder. I still do have a protein powder, right? I'm going to show it on yeah. camera uh, to, yeah. to showcase my mate Ant at uh, Shapeshifters. And it's greens, it's fiber, it's a vegan protein powder, and it's filling as it is. I used to put that, but the Bonofi one is really nice, but it, because of the greens, it is green. And I used to make cream of rice with it. So you've got this already voluminous protein yeah. powder. In this volume of cream of rice, it was. And I, I used to call it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like eating Hulk fluff. <laughs> That's amazing, mate. The, the the cream of rice. Shout out to Alex Gates. Alex Gates is the cream of rice king, and that guy tried to get me on it so much. But I just prefer the consistency of oats. That's the only reason I don't have it. But again, in terms oh. of ease and flavour, and how macro friendly it is. And the amount you end up, wow. Like off topic. Worth the Because mm. he's friend of the show. How good does Alex Gates look? It's my new man crush. Well he was oh always my, my man crush anyway. God. Voice. It looks and you know, all right. What is what is better, the fact it's not just how good he looks, it's how hard he has worked, mm -hmm. how small he was, how long and consistent he was over years. Yeah. If anyone yeah. deserves a physique, yeah, it's him. Like massively. I, I was thinking, like in Germany, and shout out to Alex if you're listening to this. I might give you a message. At one point, I'm going to get myself a coach again. And like Alex, you know, he's not as well known as he should be. He's a great coach. Yeah. He has skyrocketed into my top five people I might reach out to to coach me, right? And I've I've been in the game longer than him, but I yeah. want to listen to him. Just because leading by the leading from the front, mate. Exactly. That that he is the 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 proof of what you can achieve when you take control of every single variable, when you don't leave anything to chance, and you invest in multiple coaches, not all at the same time, but he's gone across a couple of different coaches, and you track everything meticulously, and you still have room to enjoy your life and go on holiday. And as he's quite open about, there's been assistance in there as well, but that doesn't equal a fucking result. You do not take steroids willy nilly to sound like Ricky Gervais, <laughs> sound like David. You put Brent. a lot of muscle on before assistance, though. It, massively so. Massively. He, he did it right. Over a couple of years before he. He did it considered. right. He got to the point yeah. where he hit the wall and yeah. he had the choice to make and he was consistent exactly. with everything else that that choice yeah. was a positive. Right. Yeah. It's not the guy who doesn't want to diet that thinks if I take a bit of trend, everything will be easy. Yeah. He is, he is building muscle done right. Huge shout out. Huge shout yeah. out. Respect to Alex Gates. Massively so. Uh, we, I, mean, I know we don't, we don't want this episode to be the Alex Gates appreciation episode, but at the same time, you have to remember, like, no, no one if, can if, say If anything. it equals the balance, if it equals the balance, he's a lanky <laughs> motherfucker, isn't he? <laughs> it's from the north as well. I know you are, but he's from further north as well. Um, but he, I'm in the um, Midlands, boy. He can't dance either. I don't know. I don't know what else he can, <laughs> what else he can throw it in. He no, um, neither can I. So <laughs> he he was like what well over six foot. Maybe I can't remember his exact height, but obviously made me look like a dwarf, which is not that hard. But super long levers, ridiculously long levers across every fucking angle of his body that makes it tough that makes it really fucking tough to achieve the muscle gain that you could achieve so he put on a ton of fucking muscle without ever getting assistance without injecting anything mm. ever or taking anything orally which shows he did what was right for his body he seeked expert advice mm. and followed it and he stuck to it doesn't mean he had an easy ride in the fucking slightest um and he didn't jump from plan to plan. 
and he didn't follow stupid and he went aggressive when needed and he maintained when needed and he bolted when needed and he dropped down again and it just shows to get to end up looking like Alex Gates it's a journey it's a fucking journey it's not a case of oh we just took steroids and look at him now it, no mm. look at look at most of the guys at the gym who are taking steroids they look like shit you look at Alex Gates he looks fucking phenomenal it's like an Adonis he's literally my man crush and if he fucking competes he does get around to compete him and to, to, to take this away from the Alex Gates Appreciation Show, Alex, yeah. uh, Pro, Alex yeah. Pro Coach is the guy if you want to follow him and find out for yourself. And if anyone wants a clarification why Rob says it's hard with long levers, one, not many lifts fit you when you have long levers. Yeah. But also when you're over well over six foot, putting them, you can put the same muscle on someone that's five foot five and you look like you've put on none. So he's exactly. had to put a lot of muscle on to look this much bigger. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. my next category, yes. going back to the hacks. Sorry, Alex, we're off. Protein mm. hacks, right? I don't really like protein hacks because I generally think most people, and you, you agree with this, I know you do because you better post it. Protein hacks are people that never look at a meat aisle. But <laughs> here's one I game changing. And I said about simplicity. It almost went in the simplicity hacks. Is um, Marks and Spencer's low fat bacon medallions. Not Ooh. only does it give you the taste of bacon, not only is it a thing you don't need to add sauce for it to taste good, but you could yeah. take less than five minutes to cook and per packet you get 50 grams of protein. Amazing. And you got it in the meat aisle. You didn't have to go down the weird fucking <laughs> health food no aisle. Fade jogget, no fade jogget in sight. <laughs> Mate, that's incredible. And again, something as simple as that. How good does bacon taste? It tastes incredible. And you don't you need take a lot of it. Yeah. You don't need to cook the whole packet to, to instantly add to a meal as well. It's an amazing <laughs> fucking thing. That's, that's a protein hack. That's what yeah. it is. Not trying to make your own protein icing out of powdered peanut butter and protein powder and a ton of other fucking dry ingredients. There's never going to taste as good as real icing. That's not that makes it die harder because you've taken away food volume. Yes, massively. Massively so. So, yeah, 100%. Um, I'm going to add the simplest thing in the world, which is going to make me sound like Andrew Tate. Um, <laughs> carbonated water. Carbonated water. I drink it all the time anyway because I don't like yeah. drinking peasant water. But at the same time, <laughs> it does like it. we talk about hydration, but the carbon, for some reason, makes it feel like there's there's extra stuff going in there. It's very, very satisfying in terms of dropping hunger kind of rapidly, very fucking quick. It's something to consider. If you don't like it, I don't know, maybe you're just being a bit weak. That's the only thing. Oh, I don't like bubbles in my water. Okay, well... We won't send you to war in the World War Three then, because you're too. <laughs> <laughs> you can't handle bubbles anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, mate, I love mate, that. that's, that's a, I drink it all the time anyway. But when I'm really, really on diet, man, I'm making sure that I've got I've got that handy all time. If uh, like when I'm in the environment when I know hunger's going to creep in, mm. that was a big so my... one for me. My last category, and I have three in here. One of them is, is more like this, and one of them is our, our completely off-topic ones. I right. classify it as the other category. Okay. So the first one is things like a Diet Coke. Now, this doesn't work for me, right? Mm. This doesn't work for me at all, because I probably get through about seven or eight cans a day of this anyway, because I have obsessed and I love it. Mm. But if you're not a big Diet Coke drinker, if you're a water drinker or whatever, mm. adding in that when you get to the end stage of a diet can really just take the edge off stuff. Yeah. So, and, and I would say, like, if a smart person, if it's someone you're not as addicted as me, it's good to leave them out as long as you can and then just throw that in to help you out. Again, that's the same that, with gum. Yes. Yeah. Big, big difference there. Again, if it's something you're currently doing all the time, when you don't necessarily need to, take that out of the equation for a decent amount of time. How good it will taste when you add it back in later down the line. How much actual satisfaction you'll get rather than just a little bit of instant gratification with what you do it now because that's what that's what i do now i say i say a client so i grab a coke zero when you know the sweet tooth's kicking in i, I drink it all the fucking time i drink mm. it probably more than water you know which is probably not that good but not to do yeah, it the, yeah. um but if i were to go off it for a while my god how good it would well could backfire i could eat it drink it later down the line and go this is actually shit why have i been drinking this all this time but i don't think that will be the case because it, no. it tastes amazing of course it tastes amazing so I think anyone who says they don't like the taste of it is lying to try and yeah. I don't know, hide pain in their life. So don't discount knocking these things on the head for a little bit for mm. greater effect later down the line. Massively. 
my last two... we don't cut things out anymore because again we're too soft yeah my last two my two off topic ones the first one is mm. being busy being just being like simple things people want mm-hmm. hats they want food stuff be busy be busy with work go for a walk yeah i saw a great video recently yeah from a guy called what i've learned it's a great youtube channel for people that should should go and you know shout oh. out to him and he does all these little personal experiments he, he backs them by science these great ones about sort sure. of like why red meat isn't that bad for you and you know climate change stuff and lot of fasting stuff he's very much a like a health nut and he tries these things himself and tells you he did one where it was like a five-day fast whilst trying to do something like Fifty thousand steps a day, or something like this, and he said he found it easier. And he showed like how much fat he could lose in a period, of, short period of time. And he's like, his hunger didn't was nowhere near as bad as it was when he did it before because he just kept busy doing stuff. Amazing. But the other side of that, and this is my final one, is while being busy and active is a massive benefit to keep you not thinking about food. My last one is do not be a silly dick with training volume, <laughs> because the a lot of things. And this is more for the coach out there where you like. Yeah. Every phase increase in training volume because I increase density in my workouts. But after a while, you're just making your one something you can't recover from, and B, you're just making hunger go through the roof. Towards yeah. the end of a diet, I pull sets away, do the minimum effective dose of the big lifts, and maybe spend a bit more time doing arms and shoulders and stuff that's not going to yeah. impact recovery and appetite. But if I've gone from three sets of deadlifts to four sets of deadlifts to five, I'm going to be so hungry finishing that training session to scale back for those last four weeks. And you'll be amazed at how much easier it is from an energy perspective, from a hunger perspective, from a craving perspective, mm. if you just actually match your output with what you physically can do. Mm. Massively, Sean. And it kind of goes back to what we were saying earlier about the things that are causing the cravings. There's so many things that affect it. It's not just your body's crying out for something that's missing because you've been eating 12 donuts a, a week for the last the last 10 years whatever it's anything can push that needle even if you're being really really fucking strict and still eating the right amount of protein and still getting veg in and water and sleeping right and all these things that would help curb those cravings your training volume alone can suddenly shift that through the fucking mm-hmm. roof really if you're not careful so it's definitely something so, to consider if people are thinking about so so to call this episode um uh, to bring this episode to a close i'm going to end this in a slightly different way than I normally end the episodes for you. Normally we do a plug for whichever account you're willing to, to do. And I'm not saying if you if you adamantly want to plug something there, you can. But I think our shows, I particularly get a, light, a, bit, a bit of a loyal audience. And if you are the first time here, um, go back and watch one of the other shows of Rob and he will tell you where to find him all the time. But I'm ending a slightly something different today. Because we decided on a topic for next week's show. And I also remembered why something that I haven't done yet. And I think it's perfect. So next week's topic is a little bit of a teaser for next week. Well, whether it will be next week or not, because I've got a few to do, I'm going to put these out in different orders. But when you see this title, know how this is going to start and come and watch it on YouTube. Next week's topic, we were going to have the episode called Is Veganism an Agenda? And we're going to talk about the push to a more plant-based diet and is there ulterior motives to this? We're going to slightly put on our tinfoil hats, but keep within our realm and scope of practice. But also, I remember losing a World Cup bet to Rob last year, who I promised on the Liver King episode that I would eat raw liver live on the show. I think this has got to be the episode, hasn't it? It's got to be, lad. It's, got to be. it's perfect for it. I'll come, in, I'll come in with protein, with a lunchbox full of protein hacks, and you can eat your raw liver. If, if, if you put a reminder on your phone when we click record, when we finish the recording, to message me the day before on Wednesday next week and say, yeah. Simon, remember yeah. to get your raw liver ready. That's the reason why I haven't done it so far, because I keep forgetting to buy it. Not because I'm, I'm trying to avoid it. Yeah, I really am. yeah I, would, I would forget, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's Maybe. next week. So if you're watching this point, next time when this topic comes in, go and watch it on YouTube. But Rob, pleasure as always, ma'am, and I'll see you okay. with, with raw liver in hand next week. Let's do it. Thank you.